the journey into and out of Plato's cave. Imagine human beings living in an underground cave-like dwelling with an entrance a long way up which is both open to the light and as wide as the cave itself. They've been there since childhood fixed in the same place with their necks and legs fettered, able to see only in front of them because their bonds prevent them from turning their heads around. Light is provided by a fire burning far above and behind them. Also behind them, but on higher ground, there is a path stretching between them and the fire. Imagine that along this path, a low wall has been built, like the screen in front of puppeteers, above which they show their puppets. Imagine that there are people along the wall carrying all kinds of artifacts that project above it, statues of people and other animals made out of stone, wood, and every material. And as you'd expect, some of the carriers are talking and some are silent. It is a strange thing you're describing, strange prisoners. They're like us. Do you suppose, first of all, that these prisoners see anything of themselves and one another besides the shadows that the fire casts on the wall in front of them? How could they, if they have to keep their heads motionless throughout life? What about the things being carried along the wall? Isn't it the same true of them? Of course. And if they could talk to one another, don't you think they'd suppose that the names you used apply to the things they, are, they see passing before them? And what if their prison also had an echo from the wall facing them? Don't you think they'd believe that the shadows passing in front of them were talking whenever one of the carriers passed along the wall was doing so? then the prisoners would in every way believe that the truth is nothing other than the shadows of those artifacts. Consider then what is being released from their bonds and cured of their ignorance would naturally be like if something like this came to pass, when one of them was freed and suddenly compelled to stand up, turn his head, walk, and look up towards the light. He'd be pained and dazzled and unable to see the things whose shadows he'd seen before. What do you think he'd say if we told him that what he'd seen before was inconsequential, but that now, because he is a bit closer to the things that are in his turn towards things that are more, he sees more correctly? Or to put it another way, if we pointed out to each of these things passing by, asked him what each of them is, and compelled him to answer, don't you think he'd be at a loss, that he'd believe that the things he saw earlier were truer than the ones he was now being shown. And if someone compelled him to look at the light itself, wouldn't his eyes hurt, and wouldn't he turn around and flee towards the things he's able to see, believing that they're really clearer than the ones he's been shown? And if someone dragged him away there from there by force, up the rough, steep path, and didn't let him go until he had been dragged into the sunlight, wouldn't he be pained and irritated at being treated that way? And when he came into the light with the sun filling his eyes, wouldn't he be unable to see single one of the things now said to be true? I suppose then that he'd need time to get adjusted before he could see things in the world above. At first he'd see shadows most easily than images of men and other things in water, than the things themselves. Of these he'd be able to study the things in the sky and the sky itself more easily at night, looking at the light of the stars and the moon than during the day, looking at the sun and the light of the sun. I suppose he'd be able to see the sun, not images of it in water or some alien place, but the sun itself in its own place. And at this point he would infer and conclude that the sun provides the seasons and the years, governs everything in the visible world, and is in some way the cause of all the things that he used to see. What about when he reminds himself of his first dwelling place, his fellow prisoners, and what passed for wisdom there? Don't you think that he'd count himself happy for the change and pity the others? 
And if there had been honors, prizes, or praises among them for the one who was sharpest at identifying the shadows as they passed by, and who best remembered, which usually came earlier, which later, and which simultaneously, and who could thus best divine the future, do you think that our man would desire these rewards or envy those among the prisoners who were honored and held power? Instead, wouldn't he feel with Homer that he'd much prefer to work the earth as a serf to another without possessions and go through any sufferings rather than share their opinions and live as they do? If this man went down into the cave again and sat down in his seat, wouldn't his eyes coming suddenly out of the sun like that be filled with darkness? And before his eyes had recovered and the adjustment would not be quick, while his vision was still dim, if he had to compete again with the perpetual prisoners in recognizing the shadows, wouldn't he invite ridicule? Wouldn't it be said of him that he returned from his upward journey with his eyesight ruined, and that it isn't worthwhile even to try to travel upward? And as for anyone who tried to free them and lead them upward, if they could somehow get their hands on him, wouldn't they kill him?